All right. Well, we're in uh, the second chapter of Esther. So a little break last week with our Easter message there in Hebrews. And uh, back to chapter 2 of, um, of uh, Esther. And as we go through this, I, I wanted to uh, introduce you uh, as we go along to a f- at least a few modern-day Esthers. Uh, this is uh, not just a story in history and a critical thing for the survival of the Jewish people. Uh, it's uh, important for us to understand uh, the sovereignty of God. Uh, we uh, uh, have uh, quoted from uh, J. Vernon McGee, just, uh, uh, who said that um, uh, God's sovereignty or his providence is it's like God's hand in the glove of history. And sometimes we even use that phrase, don't we? We say, oh man, you can really see the hand of God in that. Or we see God's fingerprints all over that. Uh, what does that mean? That means he's orchestrating events uh, in, uh, in people's lives. And sometimes, in Esther's case, she has no idea, of course, what is about ready to transpire. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more again about her life and maybe what some of the things that she was going through. But uh, a modern-day uh, Esther... For this morning, uh, certainly in that category would fall uh, Rosa Parks, 1955. She refused to give up her bus seat to a white man and uh, was uh, arrested for that. And, uh, uh, and thank God some real changes took place uh, in the South, but it was one of the catalysts to uh, bring some of those things about. And she writes in her book, Quiet Strength, when I sat down on the bus that day, I had no idea history was being made. I was only thinking of getting home. But I had made up my mind after so many years of being a victim of the mistreatment of my people suffered, not giving up my seat and whatever I had to face afterwards was not important. I did not feel any fear sitting there. I felt the Lord would give me the strength to endure whatever I had to face. It was time for someone to stand up, or in my case, sit down, so I refuse to move. Modern day Esther, somebody whose life and relationship with the Lord had been leading to a point where God would use them, uh, in a sense, to alter history. Uh, And uh, uh, Rosa Parks is one of those persons, and certainly she is a a modern day uh, Esther. A couple more uh, details about uh, uh, Esther and Mordecai that uh, uh, we might remind ourselves because it's been a few weeks since we've done the background and o- an overview. The spiritual climate of the Jews right now is is not good. From the time of Esther, we said it was 40 years before that Ezra had gone gone back. Uh, Cyrus, as predicted by name by Isaiah the prophet at the end of the 70 year of captivity, would give them the right and the privilege to go back uh, to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, and only about 60,000 go. Not, not very many. The spiritual climate was not good. It, it's 40 years later. Uh, they've been living in a Persian culture. Uh, they have, in a sense, allowed the, the culture to change and transform them. Uh, it was not a good time for, for Judaism, uh, we might see. Uh, and when you read Ezra, even the people that uh, were faithful enough to realize they were supposed to, uh, God's will for them was to go back to Israel, back into the land, back to rebuild the temple. Uh, even they, there's issues because they've all married pagan wives who were not, not believers and so forth. So there's, there's a lot to indicate uh, in Scripture and history. It was not a good spiritual climate for the Jews uh, at this time. Uh, small percentage of them return. We talked about the uh, historical accuracy of uh, Esther uh, and uh, the details of the Persian kingdom that we have in, in history. And in our text, we're reading about King Ahasuerus, but uh, in history, he's known as King uh, Xerxes, and there's uh, a lot written about, about him. Keep in mind that, um, uh, and we'll see that uh, there's uh, several years between chapter 1 and chapter 2, and uh, he's returned from the defeat on his attempt to, uh, to conquer uh, the Greeks uh, and was uh, unable to do that. Last time, we, we talked about his reign and uh, how it was prophesied by Daniel that he would attempt to conquer the Greeks, but not successfully. We talked about the riches of this kingdom and how impressive they were, 127 provinces all the way from northern India all the way to, uh, to North Africa, and we showed you some 
uh, slides of the kingdom, uh, comparing them to uh, previous kingdoms of the Assyrians, of the Babylonians, uh, and now the, the Persians. We talked about uh, Queen Vashti in her uh, refusing the, the command, which sets the stage for what we're about ready to read this morning. Uh, and we said, uh, though there might be some writers to disagree with us, we said she did the right thing uh, in refusing her husband because what he was asking her to do was completely uh, immoral um, because of her courage, whether she knew the Lord or not, if she ever come into contact with Esther or not, uh, we, we have no idea. We do know from history, though, that she was incredibly beautiful herself, and, uh, but uh, she has now been, been disposed. She is no longer queen, and that becomes uh, an issue here in chapter 2. Uh, and so the king issues that ruling, Vashti shall never come before him uh, again. So we get to chapter 2 and begin with the solution to the problem of no queen. Verses 1 to 4 read in chapter 2, After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Sushan, the, the citadel or the palace, into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Uh, then let the young women who please the king be queen uh, instead of Vashti. So this thing pleased the king, and he did so. So a couple of things about this solution. One is that uh, it's based on the fact that the king's anger subsided uh, and, uh, with, when he remembers Vashti. Now, again, there's uh, four years between chapters uh, 1 uh, and 2, and we kind of have that verified uh, later in verse 16 when it says, So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus, in his royal palace in the 10th month, which is in the month of Tabath, uh, in the seventh year of his reign. We started in the third year of his reign. We're in the seventh year. There's four years uh, in, in between. Yes, I did pass basic math. Did that without a calculator. The, um, and of course, what he had done is that uh, that first banquet, uh, there was 180 days of basically mission planning as well as some feasting, uh, and, then a, and then a drunken banquet that lasted seven days. And again, the history tells us that, uh, that um, uh, the Persians were just crazy drinkers, and uh, they would do these huge drunken binges that they would go on. That's, that's one of them uh, that we saw in chapter one. Remember, they head off. They go to Greece. Uh, uh, Xerxes uh, has uh, as many as a two million man, man army. He takes a million with him to conquer the Greeks. They have to get through a narrow pass. He has his private bodyguard, his uh, Navy SEALs, Delta Force, uh, Army Rangers, whatever you want to call them, called the Persian Immortals. He's in uh, 10,000 of those guys. They're the first ones in the past, and 300 Greeks, the Spartans, uh, are able to hold them off for many days. Eventually, they are all killed, but they kill thousands of the Persians. It's a tremendous setback for them. We said that uh, Xerxes, according to history, before his men came through the pass, had all the Spartans buried. He did not want his men to know how few of them killed so many of, uh, of their own. Uh, they, they go on and continue, burn the city of Athens to the ground, move through Greece, and they're defeated, though, in the battle, battle, battle of Salamis. Once that happens, uh, they return, uh, and the power would begin to decrease from the east and the increase to the west, as God had intended, as God had prophesied through the prophet uh, Daniel. Uh, it's now upon that defeat, that depression, his anger against Vashti has subsided, uh, and he remembers her. Uh, the indication here, I don't think I'm reading too much into it, there's a bit of regret. Uh, he is now regretting this command uh, and what uh, he has done. And again, we applaud uh, her, Queen Vashti. We don't know... Uh, we know a little bit about her from history, but uh, tremendous courage. Uh, her, it could have meant her life, uh, refusing to do what he was asking, but she had lost uh, the throne over it. 
the king's anger has subsided. Secondly, about his anger subsiding, it's, uh, uh, it happens when the servants propose an idea. And obviously, they've kind of thought this out. I mean, he says something, and they're like, boom, we got a plan. we got a way. We're going to do this. this is, we got it all arranged and so forth. So they have a proposal, a beauty contest to find a new queen. Verse 4, then let the young women who please the king be queen, the, the woman, young woman who pleases the king, be queen instead of uh, Vashti. And, um, and again, this is uh, for Esther as she comes involved in the story here in chapter 2. We're introduced to her and we're introduced to Mordecai and so forth. This is not something she would want for herself. Um, and uh, you need to kind of uh, keep, keep that in mind. I think we kind of glamorize this idea. We think beauty contests like uh, Miss America contest or whatever. But what are you going to do for the talent? I'm tap dancing. I don't think Esther did tap dancing for the... Uh, no, this was very, very different. Uh, you would have one shot, one shot only to appear before the king after your 12, 12 months at a spa and uh, an unlimited uh, charge card for anything you wanted, for jewelry and clothing and all that, and never a payment. I mean, that, that part probably sounds good. Uh, but what comes after it is not good. You have one shot. And, uh, Josephus tells us there's about 400 gals involved in this. Um, uh, also, we know from history, he already has over 300 concubines, uh, Xerxes. Keep in mind, he is a brutal and a cruel man. We, we kind of see God change his heart here for Esther and so forth. Uh, but that's not who this guy is uh, historically. So these gals all have one shot to appear before him. And they may be selected and they may be queen. Uh, but, but it's a 1 in 400 shot. Uh, and all these gals have been selected from across the provinces. Uh, and I'm sure they're all quite beautiful. Uh, and if they are not selected, they go into the harem. They become a concubine, which maybe now swells to, to uh, five, six, or, or 700 gals. Uh, and probably they are never called upon again. And they basically live the life of a widow. Uh, they have no family. They have no children. They live in luxury. Uh, but it's, it's, no, it's no life than any of them would want. They're not being chosen to be queen. They're being chosen to have a slight chance to be queen. Uh, and if not, they're, they're going to live the life of a widow, basically. Uh, so, so again, to help us kind of dispel maybe the, the glamour or some excitement over this idea of a, of a beauty, beauty contest. Verse 8 says, when, when many young women were gathered at Sushan, the citadel, and that word gathered means they didn't volunteer. Gathered like, take that one, take that one, take that one. That's how they did it. So again, they are being taken, including Esther. She didn't like, I'd like to try you out for the beauty. You know, it's like, she looks good, take her. Uh, nobody's volunteering for this. Uh, and, uh, and there's a very likely outcome that none of them will be happy with the results. I mean, it's, it's uh, very slim chances. Uh, that's the proposal, the preparation in verse 12. Uh, each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus uh, after she had completed 12 months uh, preparation. So a, a year of beauty treatments, or basically it's, it's a spa. And, uh, and again, the focus here on the outward beauty uh, and its uh, ability to be, in a sense, manufactured uh, as opposed to the inward beauty of a person uh, that can't be done in, in a year. That's, uh, that's something that happens over a, a long period of time. Uh, but we'll find that uh, Esther is, uh, is beautiful, of course, but so are all the others. That's the solution. The setting of uh, Esther and Mordecai are explained. So now we're introduced to them and how they got here. And there's a couple of things that are kind of fascinating about this. And I don't know if you, uh, in your reading of Head, have uh, picked up on any of these key names. But verse, verse 7, in Sushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Yaconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadasha, that is Esther, uh, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, 
The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So four, four things that I think are really uh, important about the setting. The first one, the setting reveals, in a sense, the age of Mordecai here. Very, very interesting. In verse 5 and 6, if you, if you got a, a New King James, which I've just read out of, uh, there's a little explanation uh, that uh, is required here. Uh, so I'm going to read it again. It's Sushan, uh, the citadel, there was a certain Jew uh, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. And then it says Kish. Kish had been carried away. That word is not in the text. It just says who had been carried away. And if it's who had been carried away, it's a reference to Mordecai, not Kish. Uh, and and that's, that's kind of interesting. I, I looked through a bunch of translations. I don't know why. New King James is the only one. I went back and looked to uh, Hebrew transliterated text, uh, and, the, and Kish is not there. It's just been uh, inserted. Uh, but um, if we understand that uh, uh, it's Mordecai that's been carried uh, away, uh, and he's the who in that place, that means Mordecai is an old dude, man. I mean, he's, he's like might be 100 years old. Uh, he's, as an infant, if we, if we give him that, uh, he's been carried away. And it depends with, did he go, go exactly with Yakonia or did he, because there were several, several stages of taking exiles over, over a period of time. But he, he's like at least 85 years old. So it helps us understand why Esther is 20-ish. So you can understand why he, though he's a first cousin, uh, would, would, would kind of be able to be that father figure to take her in and to raise her, uh, knowing that uh, she has no mother, no father, no explanation as to uh, what happened to them. But uh, as we'll, we'll point out later, uh, the Persian kingdom is not a necessarily a, a safe place to live if you're Jewish, uh, which is one of the reasons they, they both have, uh, uh, Bab- he's got a Babylonian name. You know, very, very interesting. We'll talk, talk about that now. Uh, the setting reveals, where we're seeing the name of our main, one of our main characters. The name Mordecai is mentioned 58 times in 167 verses. And we uh, mentioned that just to say there are uh, some, some secular writers at one period of time that said that, um, uh, that Mor- Mordecai can't even be found in, uh, in secular history and so forth, the name Mordecai. Uh, and yet, uh, Josephus writes about him. Uh, he is recorded uh, in the, uh, when writing about this event in the Feast of Purim and the Maccabees. It records uh, extensive information about, uh, uh, about uh, 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 Mordecai. And, uh, and the other thing to mention is that, uh, uh, that he's, he, this name, the name that he goes by, is, uh, is after a Babylonian, a Babylonian, Babylonian god Marduk. I think I have a... Uh, a slide that was on somebody's Facebook page, and uh, no, it was, uh, but that's uh, an inscription, uh, that's the, the god Marduk. So what, what happens, we're talking about Persians, but I'm saying Babylonians, so what's the deal? Uh, you remember like the Romans just absorbed the Greek culture into themselves. They didn't, Romans don't really have a culture, they just take the Greek culture to themselves, and in terms of religion, the Persians adopted and taken all the Babylonian gods with themselves. Uh, in the book of Revelation, it says that, that uh, in ba- Babylon is the mother uh, of all false religions. And it doesn't matter if it's Hinduism or whatever ism that's out there. If, if there's somebody or something being worshipped, you can always trace, always trace it all the way, all the way back to uh, Babylon. Uh, and it um, in itself is a, is a fascinating study. Uh, but um, they, uh, they basically have worshipped or are now worshipping in Persia in this time, uh, these Babylonian gods. Esther's name means star, uh, and, uh, and her name uh, is really from the, uh, the goddess uh, for the name which we get, Astar or Easter. Uh, that, that's why... A lot of Christians kind of cringe at the idea of saying <laughs> "Happy Easter." We use it because it kind of we know what it means. People generally mean, "Oh, that's that's uh, uh, the, the day of uh, Jesus' resurrection and so forth." Uh, it's, it's probably a little more proper to say Resurrection Day uh, because there was a, a point in time when a lot of these Babylonian gods and thoughts and ideals they make their their way 
to the west uh, to Pergamum. Uh, eventually, they make their way to Rome. Uh, and one of their uh, first uh, notable historical uh, great high priests was a man named Julius Caesar. Uh, uh, worshipped all of the Babylonian, Babylonian gods and so forth. And there's a time when the Roman Empire falls. The church has been now centered in Rome. And these things kind of get merged together. And we get things like Easter and, and some other things that have become part of the church. It's, uh, it's fascinating. But uh, again, even like uh, Daniel is his Hebrew name, but his Babylonian name is Belteshazzar. It's very, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They had their Hebrew names, but they had their Babylonian uh, names uh, as well. So Mordecai is named after Marduk, uh, and his Babylonian name is Marduka. Uh, and eventually, it took a while, but eventually, cuneiform tablets, the language of uh, of the uh, Persians were discovered, and it turns out there's a high official who served under King Xerxes whose name was Marduka. In Hebrew, that's Mordecai. So he is there uh, historically uh, in several records, uh, and that's where his, uh, his name comes from. Uh, Marduka is the Babylonian or the Persian for Mordecai. Uh, the third thing about the setting reveals the journey uh, into the captivity uh, Mordecai, again, from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, he had certainly tried to hide that fact and uh, told his cousin Esther to, to do the same. But uh, I don't know if, if a couple of these uh, uh, people's names popped out to anybody. But uh, Morde- verse 5, second half of verse 5, Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shammai, son of Kish, a Benjamite. Maybe, maybe if you're... <laughs> If you have a pretty good memory and you like to read the Old Testament, uh, when you read that Shammai, son of Kish, wow, I think I know there's another guy that was the son of Kish. And his name was Saul, the first king of Israel. So I, I just think this is a little more than a coincidence and why this is in. Why, why, why insert that? Well, it's because Mordecai, it turns out, is related to King Saul. We've got another guy in the story we're going to be introduced in the next chapter, a name Haman, over in chapter 3, verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, or Haman, and of course you're supposed to boo at that point, uh, the son of uh, Hamanate uh, Datha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. We talked again that Agagite, as in King Agag. So you remember the story? You've got, you've got Haman's relative, King Agag. You've got Mordecai's relative, King Saul, facing each other. One was supposed to, by the orders of Samuel, uh, go and annihilate and destroy all of them. But Saul, you remember, refused to do so. And Samuel has to come along and finish the business and apparently some of the descendants of King Agag escaped, and one of them's name is Haman, who now lives uh, in Persia, who becomes a high official as well. Uh, but there's another guy who's a, another son of Kish relative to Saul who makes it there as well, who's going to be elevated to uh, a city council position, uh, and uh, his name is Mordecai. Uh, I, just, I just find these things uh, uh, fascinating. The fourth thing about the setting, uh, it reveals the care that Esther uh, received. Verse 7, Mordecai had brought up Hadasha, that is Esther, uh, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. So again, that's uh, Hadasha. Her Hebrew name means uh, myrtle, and the myrtle tree was known for its aroma. So it's the idea that uh, uh, she, she would live her life in such a way to give off the, the aroma uh, of God's love and mercy and grace to others. That was apparently the hopes of her parents giving her that name. And of course, she also has a second name, the name of uh, uh, Esther or Ashtar after another Babylonian god. So uh, Mordecai's raised her. Uh, she, uh, the other thing we learn about her is her, her beauty. The, the young woman was lovely and beautiful. Uh, one word describes her overall appearance. The other word describes her physical form, uh, and uh, so she's a, she's a beautiful, beautiful gal. So when 
those uh, government leaders go out. She is absconded. She is taken uh, by force, uh, as the other gals were, uh, and, uh, and taken to the, the palace there in Sushan. The third thing, so the solution to the problem of no queen, uh, we learn in this setting a little more about Esther and Mordecai. And then thirdly, Esther's place in a unique situation, verses 8 and 9. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Sushan, the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that Esther was also taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman, uh, now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maid servants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maid servants to the best place in the house of the women. So Esther's response to the situations was unique because it kind of comes up. It's like, okay, how, how does this Jewish gal agree to marry a pagan king? She does it. Uh, she's basically taken. She's a victim in, 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 in all of this, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the light that it should be uh, seen in. Uh, she's Jewish living in a land that she's been forced to live in, uh, removed from the country of her, of her, her ancestors. Uh, Mordecai takes her in like a father to her. Uh, and now she, she is on the verge of uh, winning the beauty contest and becoming the wife of a pagan king. But of course, if she loses, she becomes a concubine, lives the rest of her life, possibly uh, like, like a widow. Uh, and yet Esther pleased Haggai, won his favor. And you can imagine, uh, I don't know, the, the, the contrast between uh, uh, Esther. Uh, do, do these gals all want to win? I think they do. Um, uh, is there a little bit of ego involved in putting these gals together that are all outstandingly beautiful? I think probably, but I think Eric, uh, what we'll see is Esther and her character uh, was probably seen like a diamond in, in the rough. Uh, look at verse 9. It's very interesting. It says, she lifted a literal uh, translation of verse 9. She lifted up grace uh, before his face. There was something about Esther that uh, a guy, he's familiar uh, with the, uh, the 300 plus uh, concubines that are already there. Uh, he's seen the 400 or so, according to Josephus, uh, that are gathered in. But he sees Esther and says there's something different about, about her. Uh, very, very, very interesting. Uh, she is able, she lifted up grace. She's able to model grace uh, to him. And, and apparently it was, uh, it was attractive. Uh, and certainly uh, as, a, as a point of practical application, I, I want to come back and talk about uh, uh, how maybe this came about here towards the end of the message. Uh, but just to say this about our own lives now, Paul says in Colossians 4, 5, uh, we're told to walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, people that are not saved, they're unbelievers, uh, redeeming the time, making the best use of the time we have. Uh, let your speech always be with uh, grace, seasoned with salt, uh, so that you may know how you ought to answer uh, each one. Uh, it's probably one of those verses that uh, we probably ought to write down on a card and put in our pocket, uh, stick on the mirror when we get up and brush our teeth in the morning. Uh, that reminder that our words and our conversations uh, are always supposed to be with grace. And, uh, uh, and uh, apparently Esther's were. At least that's, that's my suggestion. Uh, I, I don't think it was simply... He looked at her and went, man, she's like the hottest looking babe here. I'm going to give her her own digs over here and the seven best uh, gals I can put around her. I, uh, I think there had to be something about Esther's life uh, that caused this to happen. And it had to give Esther perhaps some little glimmer of hope that maybe somehow the God that she doesn't necessarily acknowledge all the time uh, she doesn't seem to be at this juncture, nor Mordecai, nor most of the Jews at that time, deeply spiritual people and so forth. Uh, but uh, it, uh, uh, but I, I have a sense that she might have been praying through this process here, knowing not, you know, what the outcome is not going to be. 
You know, sometimes when you become the victim of your circumstances, uh, whether you've been walking uh, with the Lord or not, that's probably a good time. You, <laughs> you start talking to him a lot anyway. I, I just have a sense that that's probably going on here. Uh, and then when this guy singles her out, I think it probably gives her a little glimmer of hope. It's like maybe uh, he picked me out of these 400. Maybe God is in this somehow. I, I sure have no idea. I can't see it. I don't know how this thing is going to work out. Uh, but maybe somehow that God is trying to show me that he's He's uh, allowed me and he's taken me through this process. And certainly uh, those times uh, when we're able to see that glimmer of hope at a difficult time, uh, it's, uh, it's a huge blessing. Secondly, despite the difficulty of the situation, Esther is given special treatment, as we've said. Uh, then the uh, verse 9, the seven choice maidservants, so he's picked out seven gals for her, provided for her from the king's palace. He moved her uh, and her maidservant to the best uh, place uh, in the house of the woman. Uh, I think this possibly indicates at least it's, uh, it's maybe even a, a different vicinity or some kind of a, a private setting uh, to get her away from uh, all, all of the gals. Uh, and, and the other thing that we're going to see about her is that when it comes time for her to go and, uh, and meet the king and so forth, uh, the gals are told they can take anything with them. And that means... Uh, that means how they might uh, uh, <laughs> accessorize themselves, <laughs> jewelry or whatever, uh, and they all, they all try to look the best they can. But Esther goes to him and says, hey, <laughs> this is what you do for a living. I mean, you know the king, you know the whole thing. You tell me what I should do. You tell me how I should look. You tell me how I should uh, handle myself before, before the king. Well, this is his favorite color right here. This is the favorite kind of jewelry. He, I mean, so it was a very smart thing to do. It was a very humble thing to do, uh, to, uh, to be teachable uh, and, uh, uh, and allow someone else. Uh, success blinds us, as uh, one of our good friends likes to say. Sometimes we can become uh, educated beyond our own intelligence, and um, uh, some of us that comes quicker than others. Uh, I like the bumper sticker that, uh, uh, that says, uh, it's what you learn after you know it all that really counts, you know, because you, you kind of reach that point in your life where you pretty much know it all. And it's like, okay, get over that. Now it's after that that uh, that's what really, uh, really, really counts. And, uh, and to somehow being able to just trust the, the, the sovereignty of God in a few things. I remember a number of years ago, we were having a guest speaker come over for a men's retreat like we're having David here uh, in a few weeks. Uh, it was Don McClure. Don was one of Chuck's uh, original associate uh, pastors, one of my favorite Bible teachers, uh, just a wonder, wonderful guy. And uh, we had him over, and so he's going to be teaching at the church and then out, uh, out on the North Shore with us and so forth. And, uh, and one of the guys in the church, I said, hey, you know, this is very awesome. You know, you should come. You know, you haven't heard Don before. It's going to be a great time. Uh, <laughs> he, said, he said, oh, I don't really get much out of those guys. Uh, those guys as in great Bible teachers, you don't get, you know, it's like, which, which part of those guys, you know, what, what's the, what kind of a qualifying statement is that? But I, he didn't come, and, uh, and, and he really wasn't a, around a lot uh, longer than that, and, uh, and I still see him around, and he kind of struggles with his faith, but uh, that's otherwise known as pride. <laughs> it's like, I don't get much from those guys. Uh, no, we, we need to be teachable. Uh, and certainly uh, she, she is. Uh, she's already attained what some would be considered a high position in society. She's pampered. She's given everything she wants. She has a charge card with no limits and no payments. Uh, and yet when it comes to that time, uh, she's willing to be taught uh, by anyone that can uh, teach her. And uh, again, she realizes what's on the line, that if she's not chosen, she simply becomes a, a, a concubine. So at, uh, again, she's probably 20, 20-ish 20 or so. Uh, she's uh, incredibly beautiful, uh, according to the text, uh, as well as history, uh, but uh, apparently uh, not a big ego uh, involved here. Uh, and certainly God uses the, the humble, gives grace to them. So there's a solution to the problem of no queen. The setting, we learn more about Esther and Mordecai. She's placed in a unique situation, especially being Jewish. Uh, and uh, fourthly, leads to Esther obeying special instructions, and that's in verse 10 to 14. Uh, Esther had not revealed her people or family 
For Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced uh, in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each young, young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women, for thus were the days of their preparation apportioned. Six months with oil of myrrh, six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, that's in where the concubines are, to the custody of Shahazgaz, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go in to the king again, unless the king delighted in her and called her by name. I hope we wrote some names down because there's hundreds of them, but uh, uh, you understand the predicament that uh, these gals were in. But uh, here again, we make note Esther was able to keep a secret, uh, and, uh, and sometimes, well, why, why hide the identity? Because it was dangerous. It was dangerous to be Jewish living there. But then there a long time, uh, you know, 70 years plus, but uh, uh, they're, they're not liked, and they're not Persian. Uh, keep in mind when, when Haman comes along later, and he's able to uh, deceive the king and get him to uh, issue an edict that would allow all the Persians and others in all the provinces would allow them uh, to go out and kill all their Jewish neighbors. Uh, and uh, that was all it took. It's, it's not an order to say that uh, we'll have the government uh, uh, military go and kill them. All we've got to do is give the neighbors, the people out there permission, and they'll do it. There had to be a lot of hatred uh, for, for the Jewish people uh, that that's all it took. Uh, no penalty if you kill your Jewish neighbor. And, uh, and that's, that's what's on the line. And that, that indicates to us, you know, again, why? Uh, why hiding the identity? Why, why make these special instructions uh, and keep things uh, secret? I, I can just tell you that after the Holocaust and World War II, there was, there was lots of Jewish families, even ones in this country, uh, that just stopped being Jewish. You know, there was the, uh, you know, this, this shall never happen again. Uh, and of course, you had the, uh, the struggle to, um, for the modern state of Israel to, uh, uh, to exist and so forth, which is a fascinating story uh, in, in and of itself. Uh, and then being attacked once they are able to establish themselves. Uh, but uh, horrific things in terms of anti-Semitism around the world, even though there was uh, some sympathy to the fact that six million had been killed uh, in the gas chambers uh, there in, um, in Poland. <laughs> and they just passed a law that said, you can't say that. <laughs> it's all just kind of bizarre. And, uh, uh, but that's what, what's happening uh, in, the world, in the world today. There's a lot of Jewish families that they were, they're not practicing their Judaism, so they just said, we're just going to kind of change our name, a couple letters here, and stop being Jewish, because it's not worth it. And, uh, and that's why a lot of people uh, go on Ancestry today, and they do their DNA, and they go, oh, wow, I'm like 3% Jew, or 4%, or 5%. That means that's a, a great, great grandparent, uh, just because they stopped. Uh, and that's what's going, that's in our culture, uh, and that's, that's what's happening here. Uh, change the name, uh, blend in, uh, don't face uh, the persecution. That, that's why they've got different names. Uh, it's a dangerous place, place to live. Fifthly, Esther is selected by the king. What a coincidence. Verse 15 to 18. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abiel, the <laughs> uncle of Mordecai, uh, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing <laughs> but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tabith, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. 
Then the king made a great feast, the Feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. So we've mentioned this, but just to make a reference to it again, she sought wise counsel. Verse 15, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, uh, it, uh, advised. Again, seventh year of, the, uh, of his reign, uh, and uh, she wins favor. Notice with everyone, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Uh, and again, I, I just think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's Proverbs, you know, uh, that, uh, that, that beauty, you know, charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting. It's the woman who fears the Lord that is to be praised. You know, there, there is an inward beauty as well as an outward beauty. Uh, and, uh, and one is cultivated over time. Apparently one, you can do it in a year. <laughs> and uh, although I think they probably started out with a good start. But, uh, but uh, people see Esther and there's something uh, distinctively uh, different uh, about it. And I have to kind of wonder what's going on in her mind. Is she uh, scared to death? Is she nervous? Uh, is her faith grown uh, at, at this point? We're going to see her, see her uh, faith tremendously stretched, of course, going, going forward. She, she wins the whole thing and thinks, well, that was a close call. Oh, no, we're not, we're not done with this story yet. And uh, uh, you won all of that because of God's uh, position you and, uh, and placing you and so forth. And I just have to wonder how much of this is she's a- able to process and understand about uh, God's sovereignty and, and what he's doing. But she had to think, how in the world was I chosen to get here to start with? Why was I singled out by Haggai and given the special treatment? I, now this guy sees me, never seen me before in his life, and says, she's the one. Put, <laughs> put a crown on her head. In fact, we're going to proclaim a holiday. In her honor, we're going to have a big feast and so forth. I just kind of had a feeling she's thinking, I think God's in this. I don't think she's thinking, well, they finally recognize me for who I am. I I don't think so. I think there's a humility about her, uh, and I think that... uh, that she uh, sees God's uh, uh, sovereignty uh, in, uh, in all of this uh, and, uh, and is trusting him uh, to, uh, to some, some degree. I, I don't know if you've seen the, the uh, motion picture that's out there now. I can only imagine the story of uh, uh, Bart Millard and uh, his writing that song and the motive for writing, writing that song. Beautiful, it's beautifully done. And uh, I praise God it's been very successful at the, uh, at the boss, uh, box office. And, uh, and it, um, it pays the way for uh, these guys, Christian filmmakers, uh, filmmakers to keep uh, doing what they're doing and so forth. Uh, but I, um, and, and that song, I just sold millions and so forth. But um, uh, I heard uh, Bart and his wife being interviewed on Focus on the Family uh, a week or so ago, and it, they had interviewed them uh, earlier uh, when the uh, the project first began, uh, and then now with its success, re- re- re-aired that interview. Uh, and the thing that fascinated me about it, he was just talking about how when they first started as a band, Mercy Me, they, they played like um, 250 gigs a year. I mean, that's, that's a lot of traveling, a lot of playing and so forth. Uh, and then uh, over the years, they're, they're getting married, and this is getting tougher. So they, uh, and even, and then with uh, uh, the song being a big hit and the recording contract and all that came with that. So now they're, they're down to about 150 gigs a year, uh, but it's still a lot. That's a lot of time away from uh, your family and kids uh, and so forth year after year. Uh, and so he says, we, we reached a point where we realized we, this was not sustainable. Of course, we're being told this is what you have to do if you want to have a recording contract and a recording career. You have to get out and play. People see you, and then they'll keep buying your stuff and so forth. This is what's required. And they just said, well, we can't do that. We're going to do 60 shows a year. And if that comes in July or that comes in August and whenever it is, we're done. And we're going back home, and that's it for the year, and we'll start over again the, the next year. And, it, and it, this is the line. though. He says, as far as I was concerned, uh, if that was it with the whole singing, the band, and the whole thing, and and everything, and I needed to get a job at uh, Home Depot or Walmart. I was just going to do that. This guy's brother's got a set of pipes. I, I don't know if he'd really have to do that or not, but uh, uh, but I just appreciated the, the humility uh, and the idea that he was be able to make a conscious decision to do what was right for his family, for his marriage, 
and then live with the circumstances, no matter what they were, and be able to trust the Lord. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a little bit of uh, that we can at least suggest that about Esther at, at this juncture. Um, she may have been nervous, she may have been frightened, but I think she's doing her best to see God uh, as she's the victim, remember. And uh, no mother, no father. Now, you know, she, maybe she's 20-something, and she's ripped uh, out uh, of her home and away from Mordecai. She has no idea what awaits her, uh, but there's some part of her, I think, that had to see along the way uh, God's hand in all of this. Again, God's hand uh, in the glove of history. Uh, and that leads us to the, uh, the Esther was able to recognize the sovereignty of God. Verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the other women. She obtained, notice, grace, favor in his sight more than all the other virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen uh, instead of Vashti. So great example she sets to uh, all of us, and we could liken her to like a Joseph or like a Daniel, was able to st- stand out in a, a very difficult uh, culture uh, and still still do the right thing. And then lastly, a couple of verses here that kind of set the stage uh, later for the trust and the uh, uh, that Mordecai and Esther would both need uh, in the king's eyes uh, when the annihilation of the Jewish people are on the line. And that's in verses 19 to 23. The king is saved by Mordecai. When virgins were gathered together a second time, uh, Mordecai uh, sat with them within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. So this has been standard policy for a while. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's units, Bigtha and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther. Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name, and when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. And again, this all plays later into our story, but notice there's a, a, a conspiracy here to, to uh, kill uh, the king. Uh, and historically, there were many. There were many uh, uh, attempts on the life of Xerxes, and that's how he died, by assassination eventually. Uh, but notice the, the anger of these, uh, these two guys, uh, why they, uh, we don't know what transpired, why they were anger, they're plotting to kill him. And we say secondly, and most importantly, it's no coincidence that Morde- Mordecai o- overhears the plot. Verse 21, he's sitting at the king's gate. Uh, and if you know a little bit about ancient history, you know that's where, that's where the elders gathered. That's kind of where the city council was. We, we've seen them uh, in, uh, in Israel uh, in some... Uh, older archaeological digs, uh, but when the uh, archaeologists uncovered uh, Sushan, uh, this place we're talking about, uh, they uncovered um, uh, where they could see at one time had been elaborate gates uh, to this uh, main entrance, uh, not, not very far in past those gates, then was a, a beautiful ornate uh, archway, uh, and then a room uh, uh, with seating in it, uh, and that's where Mordecai would have sat. Now, what we don't know is that did he have that position already, or because Esther is queen, she happens to mention to her husband, the king, oh, by the way, the man that raised me like a father, I think he's got a lot of wisdom. He might serve you well in the city gate. Just thought I'd mention that. We, we don't know if he gets elevated uh, because she was, and, and that, that's kind of probably a likely uh, scenario. But either way, when it says he's sitting in the city gate, He's just not shooting the breeze down there uh, with the boys. Uh, he's actually uh, in a position uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, authority uh, and so forth. And, uh, and then you've got uh, these, uh, these, two, these two guys. Uh, I just kind of have to read their names again. Bigtha and Teresh. Don't want to name your kids uh, Bigtha or Teresh. Uh, I call them the Lolo brothers because uh, it's not, think about it. You're, they're the gatekeepers. They're at the gate arguing and plotting the king's assassination. Who's 20 feet away? The city elders and rulers. That just doesn't come across as real smart to me. 
It's like, how did Mordecai know? He listened to these idiots talking about it 20 feet away from him. And it just, but what a coincidence that uh, Mordecai would happen to be there as they were happening to, in their anger, uh, and, uh, and not very smart about it, discuss how they would like to assassinate the king. No, no, no coincidence. The Lord places Mordecai there so he could hear that conversation, so it could be reported to Esther, so it could be reported to the king, so it would be recorded that Mordecai is the one uh, that saved his life. It all comes to play later uh, in the story. But again, just a couple of, of concluding thoughts here. Um, uh, Esther, uh, as I said, appears to be a victim of circumstances. Uh, she's taken uh, by a powerful king. Uh, she's commanded uh, and uh, removed from her home and from Mordecai. Uh, she's uh, keeping her Jewish identity secret uh, because the idea is that she might be executed uh, were that to be found out. Uh, and uh, again, according to one writer, According to, this is fascinating, according to verse 9, Esther pleases the eunuch uh, Haggai uh, and gains or takes uh, uh, from him favor. Uh, and one writer said the, the word uh, gains or takes is uh, nasa, uh, kindness is chesed, uh, and it notes um, uh, an idiom that's found only in the book of Esther it holds the suggestion of activeness and gaining rather than the usual idiom of finding kindness. Uh, and so let me just mention that again and why, and why I think this is important. Apparently, her finding favor was because of something she did or was doing. Sometimes we talk about, uh, oh, I just found favor in this guy's sight. Uh, we, we talk about that with... Uh, uh, John Moyner, uh, and uh, who is uh, our uh, contact person here with uh, Alexander Baldwin and so forth, we seem to have found favor in his sight. Uh, you know, we're, we're thankful that he kind of thinks we're a good church and we have a good reputation and so on and so forth. We're thankful that he speaks highly of us and so forth. He's, he's, uh, he's found, we found favor, but that's not the case with Esther. Esther did something that caused Haggai to give her favor. And, th and that's different. That's either what she did, what she said, and the kindness she showed. I want to at least suggest this, and maybe at least for the point of application. Haggai is a victim also. I mean, he, he is ripped out of his home and his life at some point in time. There's a little surgery done so he can be around all the gals. Probably not real thrilled about that. And that's his life. And he's probably serving a king that he's not real happy about. He is a victim in the story as well. And Esther comes in, and she now is a victim uh, in this story. And she could have been very bitter and angry about what has happened in her life. But instead, she saw someone else and said, he's like me. And so I'm going to be as kind to him as possible. And that's a choice that all of us have to make as well. And what she did then gained her favor and grace with him. You know, there's a lot of people out there that uh, feel very disenfranchised. Uh, and it's amazing how uh, our attitudes, our language, whether it's the, somebody working at Burger King or wherever it might be, uh, when you show people respect, every, and everybody deserves a respect, uh, when you do that and you're kind to them, sometimes it, it shocks them and you gain favor with them. We don't gain favor from manipulation, but we gain favor so that we might have that conversation with them uh, at some point in time. That's our Colossians uh, reference that I, that I think is uh, important. Some might say that she did this to be manipulative. Uh, maybe she just had a good sense of humor to go along with the good looks, uh, but uh, I, I, I don't think so. And uh, as it turns out, her alliance with Haggai ended up being critical, a critical point in the story of her eventually being chosen uh, by, by the king. Uh, one writer said this, as we'll see in future installments, uh, Esther's favor with the eunuch will prove critical to her efforts in saving the Jews as God continues to use 
the powerless to shame the powerful. She was powerless. She was the victim, but she saw God in the story. She didn't know how it would turn out. She still doesn't know how it's going to turn out. She's, she's thinking, Whew, that was a close one. I got chosen. She has no idea what's, what's coming up, the rest of the story. There's just so often we don't know the rest of the story. Uh, and we have to choose whether we'll see God's sovereignty, any clues that his hand is upon us or in the circumstances, uh, and then look around to see if there's anyone else uh, that can relate to me or I can relate to uh, that otherwise nobody would be kind to them, but I can choose to be kind to them. Or I can just be ticked <laughs> and lose, lose all opportunity for, for God to use my, my life. It's, uh, it's a decision that we make. But uh, stories like Esther and Joseph and Job help us. They help us tremendously. Otherwise, when Paul says, and all things work together for good, for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes, we go, awesome, Paul. I have no idea what you're talking about. But if we know these stories, we go, okay, I, I get that. I, I may not see it all in my life right now, but I, I can see, I can at least see the possibility of God's doing something. And God's going to give her a platform and he's going to save her people. God does that with us as well. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the story of Esther, and uh, we thank you for the modern-day Esthers like Rosa Parks, others who uh, do a, a very simple thing courageously just to do the right thing and then trust you, trust you for your grace. Thank you for uh, the strength that you gave her uh, and for all that you did in the life of Esther and saving, saving the, the Jewish people and uh, celebrating each year the Feast of Purim, that, uh, what you did sovereignly over their lives. Lord, we, uh, we just pray that uh, whatever we might be going through, or if there's anyone here that's kind of struggling with circumstances and wondering where God is and what he is doing, uh, that we'd be able to see your, your hand in our lives and be able to trust you and show, show kindness to, to somebody somewhere. Lord, that you might be glorified, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we didn't have communion last week because of Easter, so we're going to uh, take communion this morning. So if you'll just kind of hang on to the elements, I'll come back up and we'll, we'll share them together.